What a blessing to be here with you today. I, I kind of resonate with what DJ said. Turn in your Bibles to Mark, excuse me, Matthew. Of course, you know, if you're old school, you can turn in your Bibles, right? If you're not, we're going to have it on the screen in a minute. But if you're old school like me, it's uh, Matthew chapter 11, and we're going to read three verses. And just because we're only reading three verses, that doesn't mean you're getting out of here any earlier. So I just, no, I'm just kidding. Just kidding. Don't get scared. I want you to come back, okay? But, you know, I resonate with what DJ um, said about he prepared for a, a message his whole life. Um, I, I didn't necessarily do that with this one, but it has been one of my favorite passages and one that I've spent a little bit of time on to try to understand what it means for me. And hopefully you'll get some of what it might mean for you. That's up to the Lord and it's his um, job to do that. But um, it's, it's different than Pastor Jim and I could say bless his heart from on the south because he has to get up every week and find a word from the Lord along with everything else. And it's a high task. If you wonder why you try to get your pastor on a Monday and you can't get him, hopefully he's smart enough and has taken the day off because uh, it's a lot. So, so people like Mark and I and others who, uh, Randy and others who, who get up and, and preach, we have the great privilege of, uh, you, know, you know, just preaching every now and then. And um, so we get to do things like what DJ said to really spend time on something that really resonates with us. So without further ado, let's stand as we read God's word. And the word of God says, Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Amen. You may be seated. I, um, I wore my shirt that most of you who know me have seen me wear plenty of times today as, as a prop, as you might can tell. It has a little something to do with what we're talking about today. Um, but, but I wear it as a prop, but also as something that I, I really seek to... Um, um, aspire to um, and what, what, it, what it symbolizes in being able to, to rest in, in Jesus. And um, in fact, it's interesting that even from non-believers, when I wear this shirt around, and I don't wear a lot of Christian t-shirts, but this one is my favorite, and they seem to really, they really like it, which gives me pause a, a little bit. And um, I, I think partly they, they probably rightly figure out it's because I like to take naps, <laughs> you know, so I thought I'd be spiritual and get this shirt. Uh, I didn't always, but I have now for, for a couple of years. It's a ritual of mine for uh, a good reason, actually due to its ability to really refresh us and, and to regularly walk away for a moment uh, from the daily grind, um, in fact, in, in, in reading, you know, some of the most creative people in the world have imbibed this philosophy of nap taking, uh, you know, during the day or several days or the week at least. And I in no way compare to those people and their accomplishments, but I can at least aspire to what's behind it in the sense of seeking to work hopefully smarter and not necessarily harder in the most productive times of our day based on how we as individuals are hardwired. And uh, as y'all heard me say before, um, I, I think probably uh, post-heart attack, <laughs> get, getting older and learning to be comfortable in my own skin, which I find is something a lot of folks, um, typically outside of our circle, have a tough time doing, has, has really caused me to seek to incorporate this practice in my life. But it's really, hopefully, you know, it's, it's quite deeper than just taking naps but more about seeking purposefully and regularly as a way of life to find rest in the midst of a beast of burden world. And so that's the title of our message today, how to find rest in a beast of burden world. And of course, I've, I've always loved this passage, as I'm sure most of you do, if you've, if you've been reading your Bibles for any number of years like I have, um, and I envision Jesus saying it to me every time I, I start to really think that it's, it's up to me and i got to make something happen in this world that's still 
at 57 almost years of old seeks to extract so much from my life from dust till dawn if I let it. It just seeks to sift us like wheat. And um, quite frankly, though, and really what this passage is about as an actual travesty, I envision saying it to G- uh, Jesus saying it to me when his church sometimes seeks to extract the same from us, to turn me into a beast of burden with the heaviest of loads that he actually, according to his words, did not intend for me. And so over and over I, I hear Jesus saying, come to me, Mark, and I, as we saw today about being in his presence, I will give you rest for your soul. Which is salvation to be sure. It's also inclusive of that, that rest to come, that eschatological rest that is to come. But it is also a life of Sabbath rest and is, is, is to mean so much more and also equally has to mean for me and I think possibly for you saying no to a myriad of great and wonderful things in order to more consistently say yes to the things that God has for you. And I hinted at these things in a message um, some time ago about trying to be Mary in a Martha world. And so there will be some repetitive thoughts here around that, but hopefully adding much more to that. And um, those of you who know me know I have some repetitive repetitive uh, refrains because of hopefully, and we all do, because of where the Lord is taking us in our life, in in our journey. And we're collective, but we're also individual um, children. And um, so I need to hear that often, and so I'm hoping that maybe you do too. Now, obviously, um, the immediate context is in the beginning of chapter 11, laying out for us the fact that even as of yet, even John Boy... Uh, who Jesus says is Elijah, if they are willing to accept it, he doesn't get it yet. And it's interesting so, because he's sitting in a prison cell, waiting for his head to be taken, and there's no sign of a Messiah all of a sudden, and that pain he's experiencing is going to take over, as far as he can tell in the natural, which when you're in prison, you know, the natural can definitely take over. And so in several examples following, Jesus uh, shows that neither John as an ascetic or Jesus as a perceived party animal, which is what chapter 11 alludes to, uh, uh, are not perceived rightly by the religious elite either as to what these two are in fact about and what their purpose was, nor do they understand what is really going on. And I'm coming off here, so y'all help me out. But before our, our text, at the tail end of Matthew 11... Jesus applauds the fact that God would have it this way by keeping it from, if you will, the power brokers so that little old you and I could get the simplicity of the gospel and the core of what he is trying to say. And I pray for you as I pray for myself today that that will resonate with you today. Uh, This context is also before chapter 12, verses 1 through 5, where Jesus is going to address the Pharisees over their wrongful application of the law as his disciples are found picking grain on the Sabbath. And then afterwards we have Jesus healing a man with a withered hand also on the Sabbath. But the problem with the Pharisees is not getting to the heart of what God always desired from his people, which was behind the law, and certainly not all their additions because they added a whole lot of stuff. But that if you got that right, you would have everything in that we are to simply love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, and mind. And then he reminds them in verse 8 that he is indeed the Lord of the Sabbath and that the Sabbath is made for man. But before we move on and look at several aspects of this thought today, and, and many translations you know, will, will do us good to find what the real context of what these three verses are. But they're found in Matthew 23, and I really like the way Eugene Peterson in the message approaches those first four verses of Matthew 23. He's talking about this specific passage that we're addressing when he's uh, introducing the woes against the Pharisees. And he says, 
Now Jesus turned to address his disciples along with the crowd that had gathered with them. The religion scholars and Pharisees are competent teachers in God's law. You won't go wrong in following their teachings on Moses. But be careful about following them. They talk a good line, but they don't live it. They don't take into their hearts and live it out in their behavior. It's all spit and polish veneer. And then he says, instead of giving you God's law as food and drink by which you can banquet on God, subliminal alert, they package it in bundles of rules loading you down like pack animals or beast of burdens. They seem to take pleasure in, here it is, watching you stagger under these loads and wouldn't think of lifting a finger to help. And so there we have it. There's a lot to think about there for us, and the reason is this is not a message against you Pharisees. This is a message against the Pharisee in all of us as we come before the Lord. And so we have the context here, what Jesus is talking about in the frame of thought in which he's saying to you and I, come to me, all you are weary and heavy laden, or as the NET uh, words it, uh, burdened, and I will give you rest. And that at the outset seems so obvious, but man, in a New York minute and every day and twice on Sunday in this beast of burden world, it is so easy to let it slip. And it is this, we need to remember very simply, to come consistently to the only one who can give us true rest. He is the only one. We sang about that this morning over and over. He is the one. In other words, we need to know who's giving it and who ain't. And let me just tell you, the word, the world has no desire to give you any of it. It's, it's not its desire to give you rest. But also, what we want to take away from this passage today, because this is what Jesus is talking about, many times it's it's not always in the church as an institution either. And it's a slippery slope we have to be careful with. The concept of uh, rest is not a new thought in the Scripture. It's continually talked about, as one author reminds us, uh, begins in the Torah and on through the Old Testament, both to the word spoken itself the people's obedience to the commands, that's the one we like, of entering somehow into it, and paradoxically, not having anything at all to do with our performance, i.e. the gospel. And so there were hints of that even then. And yet, it's also something, according to Hebrews, that the Israelites never were able to enter into true at all spiritually, and of course physically, only in getting the Sabbath day box checked having occasional rest from their enemies, as we see, and in terms of the land that only became partially true about 70 years ago. But nonetheless, Jesus calls out to the burden, those weighed down to the demands of their so-called spiritual directors, or I like the way the Amplified Version puts it, weighted down by religious rituals that provide no peace. Rituals that provide no peace. And The message that I just want to remind us about, also in grace, is that what I always try to preach from the vein of, and I think we always need to do that, is that if we are going to represent Jesus properly, we need to have we need to share with others what it means to come to Jesus and find actual peace and rest. It's a really great thought to ponder. And so contrarily, Jesus says, I'm the only one that can give this in terms of the true rest of salvation without the oppressive uh, nature and the tendency towards legalism because, quite frankly, that's what was being served up every day to the people burdened already from their spiritual leaders through Roman oppression, constant occupation by others throughout their history with no end in sight, and just quite frankly, dealing with life. Dealing with life in general. And so you and I are smart. We get it. And if so, it should be no shock to us that early on, the early church is already having a problem with this. 
It's already having a problem. We think we're a New Testament church. Well, be careful when you say that. Because the New Testament church was a mess. And we find it in Acts 15, 10, and 11. After the Judaizers were trying to add the law to the backs of the new converts, Peter, who had already learned a lesson from his brother Paul and from a dream he had, okay, comes and says to them, Now therefore, why do you put God to the test? Listen to these words by placing upon the neck of the disciples a yoke which neither our fathers nor we. That's why it was good news and they signed up. It was not good news to their fathers nor we have been able to bear, but we believe and are saved through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ the same way as they also are. This uh, this also echoes Romans and uh, throughout Paul's gospel, um, the gospel, um, and of course the whole book of Galatians spends a great deal of time dealing with this complicated issue that continues to raise its ugly head as he would say that anything short of the purity of the gospel, he would wish that they would be accursed. In fact, he goes a little further and says that, that anything short of that, that, that they would go on in, in chapter 5 and verse 12, he would wish for their emasculation. Now all of a sudden you men cringe, and I get it. Paul doesn't really mix any words there, and so we must also know, although he had many flaws, our Protestant father, Martin Luther himself, rightly brought back to the forefront after eons of the church going Back time and time again, exacting heavy loads from the people that it would draw. In fact, listen, many of the early church fathers that we idolize, and some of them are to be idolized in in a sense, were again gravitating back towards this legalism as spiritual directors of the beast of burdens of their day, still not fully understanding grace. Amazing how the best of us, We still forget. And we must also know that though we are all beasts of burdens to some degree in this world, yet not fully entering yet into that rest that's promised, but we are those also have not yet as many times entered into the the rest of salvation and this life offered rest and peace right now for you, which is why Jesus told them, to trade the yoke of the world and the spiritual directors of the church of his day for his, that he said, not me, would be light and easy. And and though we don't want to get ahead of ourselves, what Jesus is saying that, as hopefully we've already seen, only one person can give you that rest, and his name is Jesus Christ. But also what Jesus did not say is come to your religious leader or come to the church for every answer even though there is application in Scripture for this. So don't hear what I'm not saying. But as he looks around and sees those who are just beat up every which way but Sunday by oppressive burdens that they cannot carry, he consistently sees those who are to be God to them not carrying the burden for them or themselves. But more importantly, the the historical diatribe against them by the prophets in that they would not lift an inch to lift the burden of the people and show them somehow how to live in the rest promise since they missed it totally themselves, which is why they were accused of not being shepherds and also why Jesus would say when he looked out, he did what? He saw people who were lost and walking around as sheep with no shepherd. Wonder what he'd say. Amen. Wonder what he would say today at a quick perusal of Christian YouTube channels with all those teachers claiming that they have the truth on the matter and what you and I are missing. Which one would he actually watch? I'd like to know. That way I could delete a few. Something to think about. And quite frankly, we know why the leaders had this bent and it's because the business of slavery is a good business for those who are, who are in the slave business. Because they can keep everybody in line, keep the coins in the coffer, and keep people dependent 
on regurgitated food from teachers only, hear me, teachers only, instead of the word that comes from God daily into their own restless souls. This has to happen if we are to find the rest and peace of Christ. And so if you're here this Sunday morning and you're weary and you're looking for rest, then it's time to come to Jesus. And the second thing is this. We have to be willing, as Jesus says, to trade the yokes that weary and burden for the yoke that Christ gives. Because in fact, after he lets them know that he is the only one that can actually give it, he lets them know also that when they come, they need to do a little trading. They have to trade this heavy yoke they are carrying from both the world and the religious leaders, supposedly in their care, for the light one that he wants to hook them up to and walk alongside them. And we're all smart Bible students here, so we know a little bit about yokes. Yokes are for, and thus the title, placed on beasts of burdens, right? Um, we know a little bit about that. Um, it was oxen and other animals that did the work of the tilling and many other things. And yet it's also a symbol of obligation and even subjection signifying a form of enslavement, which is why Jesus brings this up. And Jesus says the reason he wants them to trade it is because the load that he is going to give them, though it will cost us everything and nothing, (laughs) it's a paradox. Don't try to figure it out. Just trust me. Work with me. It's easy and useful and actually comfortable, and the light burden is not burdensome at all, but it is a load that is carried by a real shepherd that can actually lead us into rest, since he, the word of God says, is able to save to the uttermost those who he always lives to intercede, as Hebrews tells us. And the reason, of course, is because it's Jesus' load, and it's not man's load. It's it's not rocket science here. And, And because Jesus' load and not man's, and when we continually come to him alone and actually do what the law has always wanted us, which again, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Listen to me. Listen to me, out of that relationship of love and by having someone reliable to carry the light load with us that we would desperately just only always want to be with him and in his presence. And sometimes I wonder if some of us, regardless of what you're going through, still believe that. Maybe you never really did know that Jesus came to give you rest. And I pray that you don't walk out here today without that. I think uh, the disciple whom Jesus loved, John, captures it quite well when he says these words. He says, for this is the love of God that we keep his commandments. And get this what he says. And his commandments are not burdensome. And the reason they are not is because they are born, hear me, nurtured and achieved through the impetus of love. And because the total commitment to love with all our hearts, soul, and minds, which was What God was after in the very beginning is birthed and realized only through the power of the Holy Spirit from start to finish. It's only through the power of the Holy Spirit. And it's a mystery. This spirit, this being born again, like the wind that blows. And nobody knows where it blows. Ephesians 2, 8, 9 tells us a scripture that we all know. But maybe for our sake today, we'll hear it again. For by grace you've been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. And by the way, that's not just a one-time event. That's throughout your walk. It's going to be through faith and not of yourselves. But it is the gift of God, the Holy Spirit come alongside us to help her, not as a result of works, meaning ours, so that no one may boast in case we forget sometimes. You know, and we do, right? Right? If you're like me, I don't know. I don't think I'll ever be a preacher who doesn't sweat. But y'all have already gotten used to that now. It just is what it is. It's, 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 I need to get on that that what they call that slim fast or something. I don't know. But this always confused me. I can remember as a young man trying to reconcile the seeming paradox whereby I was asked to obey Christ's commands. 
uh, which is, you know, at me, for me was no easy task to be sure. And yet it wasn't actually me, but it was God was doing it. I scratched my head a lot on that one, trying to figure that out. And, 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 and I, I realize as I, as I wrestle with this that, that I have nothing really more to do other than acceptance of his finished and completed work in my life at the end of the day, but to simply love him and abide in him. Go hang out in John 15 for about a week. And just don't leave. It's a mystery to be sure. Through some spiritual osmosis, he does it. I have no idea. But he's carrying that load with us, making it easier so that we learn to walk mile after mile after mile in this beast of burden world until such a time as we enter into that joy of the Lord. But he would like for us, he offers us some of that joy right now. Grace is scandalous. You'll never, you'll never figure it out. It's scandalous. So simple. So not to do with us. And, and yet likewise missed an awful lot by us. But there's something else worth understanding here that in order to take Jesus' yoke, we have to trade the yoke of religion and the extra work that many times unknowingly even the church at large can exact from us to continue to measure up to those who are constantly watching us, right? To see how we're doing. Um, but actuality, the Word of God says, we have to trade the obsoleteness of the old covenant, Hebrews 8.13, for the new one. Some of us, you know, don't like the sound of that. But, but I'm, just, I'm just quoting what the book says. You know, since I've been here, actually, it's a testament to this church and to Pastor Jim and Mark and some others. I've uh, learned a lot, as you've heard me say before up here, about understanding what the obvious Jewishness of the Scriptures bring to my overall understanding of what God is up to and has always been up to. And I've, I've been the richer for it, to be sure. But somehow I think there is still a strain of us in the church that thinks somehow we have to go back and become Jews all over again in order to somehow really get the whole enchilada. And that maybe until we do that, there is still something no, you know, that we must do here. Now, I see that sometimes and I scratch my head because, you know, what I've been tempted myself, it sounds really cool. But guess what? Paul, in case we've forgotten, addressed this head on, did he not? Romans chapter 2 and verse 28. For he is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh, but he is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is that which is of the heart by the Spirit, not the letter, which is the law, in case you were wondering, and his praise is not from men, but from God. Or how about this? In Galatians 4, 9, and 10, where he says, why are you turning back to the weak and elemental things to which you desire to be enslaved all over again? You observe days, months, seasons, and years. There's nothing wrong with those things in terms of extracting meaning from and identifying with our, with our messianic brothers and sisters in Christ. But we have to, and this is hard for us. It's hard for me of a lifetime of trying to follow Jesus, man, really wobbling sometimes. Is, is, is we have to trade this law of performance as we walk on this narrow path for a new law of grace and total reliance on the Holy Spirit in our lifetimes so that he can write his laws on our hearts. And he's the one who does the writing and says we can cling to the ancient path, Jeremiah 6.16 reminds us, so that we'll turn and follow him and find rest for our souls. And, you know, I look around, and look, that's why, you know, I'm wearing this shirt, because I've been that guy. I see people who really need to slow down just a little bit so they can see it. And so we have to consistently come to the only one who can give rest, and we've got to be willing to trade our yokes for his easy and light. And thirdly, we have to enroll in the lifelong learning of our new yoke giver, he says. Jesus said, learn from Joe. No, he did not. It rhymes, but he didn't say it. He said, learn from me. 
And so by being his students, his disciples, and enrolling his class, this is how we do that. Uh, the word learn, quite simply, uh, means implies study and observation of the scriptures and an observation here of what Jesus-shaped spirituality looks like as opposed to merely a church-shaped one. And, and it's a big difference sometimes, drastically so, and, and, and sometimes you'll be on the outs because you don't fit into that narrative. And this is our directive, and the disciple whom Jesus loved again gets it right, which he does all the time. He writes in 1 John 2, 6, the one who says he abides in him, picking up from his John 15 admonition, ought himself to walk in the same manner as he walked. And as a quick side note, if you ever want to do a little study, go and look in the Gospels. Jesus exemplified a life of balance, of work and rest, reflectiveness, solitude and prayer and encouraged his disciples to do the same. You should go and take a look. But notice John also didn't say we're, we are to walk in the way the church walked. And I mean this no shame at all to the church at large. But the church, quite frankly, often forgets that it neither bypassed the fall. <laughs> because it's you and I that are in it, which is what the church is. Amen? Yeah. And we mustn't forget that. We have to constantly keep that in check. And that doesn't mean when I say that, that leaders can't instruct and can't be helpful and, and be part and parcel of of the means in which God, God helps direct people. Otherwise, Pastor Jim and the elders and myself and whoever else aspires to do it might as well sit down. But we also have to know that when this is not happening and recognize that we have one audience and that Jesus wants to give us his load with himself, which is gentle and always lowly in heart toward us as we keep walking forward with his light yoke and with his light burden. In fact, I, um, there's one thing I would tell new converts in this room. Uh, in no uncertain terms, you should never bypass the church. Jesus never gives us that option. You might need to find one that works for you, but don't take forever in a day like I did once upon a time. However, in no uncertain terms, I tell new converts, if that's you today, keep your eyes on Christ and not man. Listen, that's easy to say. It sounds really cool. Keep your eyes on Christ. That's spiritual. Surely that's in the Bible somewhere. Yeah, it is. But it's the truth. Because men, even this man, sometimes will fail you. But we are told that there is one that sticks closer than a brother, who that when the world, listen, exacts so much from us, and even the church sometimes that bears his name, he will gladly swap that burden that we are carrying for his and allow us to sit down and learn for him, from him and learn from the rhythms of grace as a result. And over time, living uh, long at that vine of, of the nutrients of his love so that it has a chance through the Holy Spirit's work to flow more and more into us somehow so that we can see the promise of his rest coming to us over the horizon. But here's the rub. <laughs> If you do this, sometimes you, for a period of time, you might have to walk alone a little bit, just, just as an FYI. Because law keepers are everywhere, all around us, and sometimes they are us, and they're watching. Paul reminds us almost, I think, speaking of the same passage in verse 13 of Galatians 6, for those who are circumcised do not even keep the law themselves, but they desire to have you circumcised so that they may boast in your flesh. I've always found it interesting. I've been one of them before, and I've probably done it to some people. You know, you, 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 you first come into the faith, everybody's preaching grace and love, and you're so cute and cuddly to them. You're a nice, new, shiny little toy. And then all of a sudden, there's this unwritten code of the church law that they are almost sure is holy writ itself, and it starts to secretly, through innuendo, be, be imposed upon you by the looks of others, that you haven't quite lived up to it yet. And they surmise a number of things. You know, maybe you don't pray enough. Maybe you're not committed enough. And on and on the list goes. And bless their hearts, they don't even realize it sometimes. I don't even realize it sometimes. 
but we show our judgment measuring ourselves by only the things that we do pretty well, yet making you realize that you don't quite live up to it. The code that they, like the Pharisees, have added to the gospel. And this is a word today from the Lord, not because I'm saying it. It's because it's right here in front of us. And the code says all you have to do is just start doing exactly like I do, showing up when I do, and then the pleasurable grin starts to look kind of Grinch-like. You know, that little grin the Grinch has. Paul says, they boast in your flesh. He says, may it never be that I would boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. But the dilemma, as I said earlier, has been around for a long, long time. Because, you know, there are people that think that they, you know, they made a confession one time 60 years ago and they're good to go, right? And then there's those that think God exacts, you know, nothing from us. There's always going to be cheap grace proponents out there. There's always Judaizers. Listen, there's always law keepers and those who, when you do what they've added, won't even help you carry that extra load since the beginning. It's human nature to gravitate back to the law. And what I've come to realize is that God is always, as Pastor Jim reminded us again last week, he's always in the center of this biblical tension. God is... (laughs) is both and, not either or. And it's something that we have to learn from him. And the only way we can do that is to abide in Christ and in his love and to learn how he walks and talks and how gentle he is and how he wants to guide you along that path of peace and rest. And then lastly this morning, you can say amen. You know, I said that joke when I first got here. You know, what does it mean when the pastor looks at his watch? Absolutely nothing. Means nothing. No, we'll land the plane here in a second. This is important, though. We have to then purposely make a daily choice to seek to live a life of rest that he offers, hear me, in your circumstances. Not that guy, not that gal, but your circumstances. And I say in your circumstances, going back to a constant theme you've heard me use in saying that God has no grandchildren like we do, but only children, because he will deal with you as a loving father and you as his sons and daughters always. I don't agree with Bono on a lot of things, but he's got it right in one of his songs. Grace is the thought that changed the world forever. Don't ever lose this. It is a lifestyle of rest for your souls that you on purpose choose to live rather than desiring to go back to Egypt's sin and that slavery or to God, God's people's religion. Amen? That's a very slippery slope. But both of those, religion and the slavery of sin, are very similar bedfellows that equally enslave and will kill you, and will strip the joy of your Christian life, and will cause you to walk out because you miss the Jesus of peace and rest. This is for me this morning. I I, I think Mark Buchanan uh, reminds us what this purposefulness looks like in his book, and I highly commend it. The rest of God, restoring your soul by restoring Sabbath. And he writes this. When I say Sabbath, I also mean an attitude. It is a perspective, an orientation. I mean a Sabbath heart, not a Sabbath day. A Sabbath heart is restful even in the midst, your circumstances, of up, unrest and upheaval. It is attentive to the presence of God and others, even in the welter of much coming and going, rising and falling, It is still and knows God even when mountains fall into the sea, he says. And the writer of Hebrews reminds us, let us be diligent to enter in to that rest. To be diligent and purposeful in the midst 
of our individual beast of burdens lives. You and I, me and you. It's interesting, David seemed to get it, didn't he? One of our favorite psalms, Psalm 23. Listen, briefly as we close today. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. What? Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. I fear no evil. You are with me. Yoked right alongside me. Your rod and staff comfort me. Not load me down. You prepare a table for me in the presence of my enemies. You've anointed my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Hallelujah. I think David understood the gospel. What do you think? Amen. He learned from the good shepherd an attitude of rest and life in his circumstances until the ultimate rest of dwelling in the house of the Lord forever comes. In closing, do you, do you know where to come for actual rest for your soul? Got your eyes in the right place? Do, do you know who to come to time and time again? Or, or maybe you were, you, know, you were introduced to him once, but the simplicity and the lightness of his yoke was quickly traded for a new burden added to the old one. So now you got two. That has now made you twice as weary and beaten up in your circumstances. And so you decided, well, <laughs> this is too hard. Or you came in and you learned a lot. And you know, you learned a lot from some good teachers. And that's good stuff. And you read some books. And you learned the seven steps to do that. And the five steps on how to do that. Maybe you were uh, even discipled a bit about what it's supposed to mean to follow Jesus. But before long, you realized that the burden of that got heavier instead of lighter. And, and, and you've never really digested the word of God, which is also Christ, by the way. Don't separate those two. Digested the word of God on your own daily, purposely, going after it like a hungry dog on a meat wagon. Like a deer, the word of God says, panting after the water brooks. Or maybe you've just never regularly sprawled yourself out on the floor and just laid all the cards out on the table as a regular practice to ask God to just daily pour something of his goodness in you so that you can be somehow representative of that in this beast of burden world. To which, hear me, you are not alone in, by the way. You're not alone. It's a world which may have exacted much from you in the scars show, both those of your own doing and those that may have been out of your control. And so I pray today that you'll do a swap. You'll be willing to relearn from the light yoke giver and as a result experience his blessed forgiveness continually and his rest for your weary soul in this world that wants to sift you like wheat and a much, much lighter burden even now. And when you do, it should feel something like this.
I never get tired of, uh, of that scene. If you haven't watched the movie, The Mission, I implore you to do so. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I thank you so much for using insignificant vessels to talk about you because that's all you got. And I, I just pray that, that the words of, this, of these thoughts that I've done my best to extract from your words, Lord, that they would be life and peace and rest to someone here today. That they would carry it with them. Or that they wouldn't leave today until they, until they got it right on their own or with someone they know. We thank you for this day that we celebrate with mothers who know a lot about burdens. I pray every mother here today can lift any burden that's, that's weighing them down, that's weighed them down. And they can take your yoke upon them, Lord. We bless you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. I know a lot of us have some places to go and see some moms and things, but if, if, if it's something that you, you, know, you want to talk to somebody about or you want to get right in your seat before you go, or even if you want to come talk to little old me, well, I'm not so little, but um, please feel free. I encourage you to do that if you need to, and we'll stick around for a little bit. God bless you, and happy Mother's Day. Amen.